For this episode of Roaming the American River Watershed, I wanted to find a less traveled location. Beauty, wildlife, and adventure can all be found visiting the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Searching a Delta map, I noticed an island marked Liberty Island Ecological Reserve. The map showed a bridge connecting the island to a paved road. Find the road, cross onto Liberty Island, and have a fun photo day exploring. As you will see, things didn't quite go as planned. However, we did discover a special place for those looking for adventure. I was honored to have along videographer and author Steve Hubbard and two award-winning photographers Evan Burnett and Phil Robertson. Our journey takes us west on Interstate 80 where we cross the Yolo Bypass. Few who travel over the causeway know its necessity or its history. Longtime residents of California know that California's rainfall is capricious. Years of drought can be followed by the following year with heavy winter rainfall. When heavy winter rainstorms strike Northern California, the Sacramento and the American rivers can rise quickly and overflow their banks, causing damage to both cities and agriculture. Mining operations in the adjoining mountains exasperated the problem by sending mountains of silt downstream. As the river bottoms filled with debris, the river's flood basins expanded. Beginning in the 1850s to keep the valley's rivers and streams constrained, a series of earthen levees were constructed. When earthen levees were no match for periods of torrential rainfall, a second line of defense was added, the construction of major dams. To further control flooding on the Sacramento River, it was proposed to build a relief valve, allowing the Sacramento River to expand her floodplain during periods of heavy rain. The Sacramento River Floodplain Management Project was first approved by Congress in 1917. In the 1930s, further federal funding would complete the project, creating the Yolo Bypass. The bypass would average three miles wide and would extend 40 miles from Marysville to our destination, Liberty Island. As we pass over the causeway, keep in mind that the causeway is an important wildlife area. Anxious to visit Liberty Island, we pass Chili's Road and take the next exit, Mace, and head south into the Delta. If you connect three points, the city of Sacramento, the Carquinas Strait, and the city of Stockton, you form a Delta and create a rough idea of the size of the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. In reality, the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta is an inverted river delta. Sediment from inflowing rivers accumulate inland rather than form out into the ocean. How the inland Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta was formed will help explain how the delta became an important agricultural region of California. Understanding its geology will also help understand the political battle over its future. To understand how the inverted delta was created, we will have to travel far back in geologic time. For millions of years, the Pacific Continental Plate pushed against the North American Plate in a process known as subduction. Over millions of years, the force of the Pacific Plate would lift and create 400 miles of the California coastal mountains. 
From 758,000 to 665,000 years ago, rivers flowing from the eastern slopes of the Coastal Range, the Cascade Range, or the Sierra Nevada would eventually be blocked from draining into the Pacific Ocean. With no outlet, like a bathtub, the Central Valley became a massive lake. At its height, Lake Clyde, as geologists called it, measured 600 miles long and may have reached 1,000 feet deep. 600,000 years ago, a sudden breach in the coastal mountains occurred. Water in Lake Clyde began draining westward towards the Pacific Ocean. Today, we know the breach as the Carquinas Strait. As Lake Clyde drained, water behind the breach slowed dropping sediment. The first stage in the birth of an inverted delta had begun. Eleven thousand years ago, and continuing for the next five thousand years, marked the end to the last ice age. With warmer climate, glaciers receding send enormous amounts of sediment down the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. The sediment accumulated, creating marshes and mudflats. Over this period, the Pacific Ocean would rise 300 feet. San Francisco Bay was born. This is how the California's first people would have viewed the Delta. It would remain untouched until just after the beginning of the California Gold Rush. The Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta drains 40% of California's land mass. With the discovery of gold, California's population exploded. To feed the new residents, a quick source of food was needed. The Delta marshes had one food resource that was quickly exploited. From the gold rush to the Great Depression, ducks, geese, and shorebirds were harvested. One estimate reported a quarter million birds per year were brought to market. Throughout the marshlands of the Central Valley and the Delta, the Thule elk were hunted to almost extinction. The early settlers disliked the taste of California's native fish. They missed the fish they had consumed on the East Coast. The newly formed California Fish and Game Commission eagerly complied to the public's wishes by introducing exotic fish into the San Francisco Bay and into the Delta. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad made it easy to transport fish from the East Coast to the West Coast. In 1871, 10,000 American Chad Fry were introduced into the Sacramento River. In 1879, captured in New Jersey, California Fish and Wildlife began importing fingerling striped bass and releasing the bass into San Francisco Bay. Within just a decade, striped bass was in enough abundance to be made available in San Francisco's fish markets. Fishing for stripers or black bass became a favorite pastime, up to the present time. Turning the Delta's marshland into productive farmland required first to transfer the title of the land from the federal government to the state and from the state to individual ownership. The Swamp Land Act of 1850 transferred 2,192,975 acres to the state of California. California would act as a middleman. The actual cost of reclamation would be left to individuals and corporations.
As tules decompose, they mix with the silt of the delta, turning into peat. With little else to work with, dried bricks of peat would be the building blocks of the delta's first levees. Chinese labor was able to cut peat, sod, and stack the sod along the banks, creating a levee. The Sacramento Daily Bee, March 9, 1866. The Thule Lands. Few persons have anything like an adequate idea of the extent and the ultimate value of the Thule lands of this state. The same causes which from the earliest epochs of history down to the present moment have made the delta of the Nile so amazingly productive have operated here, and whoever this land has been fully reclaimed, its productiveness staggers belief. It is true, but few tracts have been made fit for cultivation, and the cost of reclamation is so great that years must elapse unless greater means are furnished before any considerable portion can be made fit for farming. When Delta land was first offered to the public, there was an effort to restrict transfers to less than 200 acres per person. However, within a decade, all restrictions were removed. Within 10 years, the sod levees began to fail. To enclose even larger blocks of land, new technologies would be needed. Innovation would come to the rescue. The clam dredge could break through peat and raise large buckets of earth faster than teams of men. New systems of draining water were also developed, as well as one of the greatest of innovations for farming, as well as for modern warfare, a tractor able to navigate the Delta's soggy soil. Benjamin Holtz, Stockton, California's tractor company, would grow into today's Caterpillar Tractor Corporation. All Ushijima Kinji wanted to do in life was to enter a Japanese university and study Chinese literature. One prerequisite to enter the university was the ability to speak English. He tried to fake his oral exam but failed miserably. In 1889, undaunted, he boarded a steamship for San Francisco. His goal was to become a houseboy, learn English, and return to his studies. After a year as a houseboy, he changed his name to George Shima, and instead of returning to Japan, left San Francisco for Stockton. In Stockton, he first worked as a day laborer. He soon switched to management, becoming a Japanese labor contractor. He had an itch to own his own land. He started with a small 10-acre plot. He experimented with different row crops, seeing which crop was best suited for the Delta's rich soil. Later, with a partner, he purchased 600 acres. He discovered potatoes would thrive in the rich loam of the Delta. By 1913, he controlled 28,000 acres and produced 85% of the potatoes produced in California. In 1920, his Shima Potatoes brand was valued at $225 million in today's dollars. By 1930, some 50 islands, or tracks as they were called, had been carved out of the delta. With the financial success of George Shima, as well as with other successful delta investors, Robert Malcolm, led a group in a major undertaking. In 1917, they would undertake to enclose, with levees, 5,000 acres of Delta marshland. Because of America's entry into World War I, he would name his island Liberty Island. Robert Malcolm sublet a portion of Liberty Island to tenant farmers. The Sacramento Daily News editorial was prophetic. The land was bountiful, producing safflower, Sugar, beets, milo, lima beans, tomatoes, wheat, barley, asparagus, cucumbers, celery, peas, and potatoes. In 1928, the island received ferry service, a bridge and a road connecting the island to Rio Vista. 
The island had a permanent population of 300, making it self-sufficient for all its basic needs, including a school. The population would balloon to an additional 1,500 during the picking season. In 1949, a labor camp was constructed. Supplied with electric power and butane, Malcolm bragged it was the best camp in California. What destroyed the island was repeated floods. From 1918 to 1973, 55 years of production, Liberty Island was flooded 27 times. By 1997, the island flooded for good. In 1999, the island was sold to the Trust for Public Lands. Just one more turn and we will finally be at our destination, Liberty Island Bridge. As you'll see, our journey to Liberty Island Bridge was an immediate disappointment. Just five years before Liberty Island was abandoned, the state of California built this new bridge. The locals call it the Bridge to Nowhere. And we're in no man's land. Uh, walk through uh, water and there is no place to go, nowhere we can go any place. And um, it's gone nowhere. We're going to need some more help in trying to understand what happened. And I know there's a local biologist that uh, we'll go see and maybe he can help us uh, tell the rest of the story. On our return trip, we would need a boat. Our plan was to meet Bill Roper, Director of Biological Resources. Bill has agreed to explain the restoration work being done on the now mostly flooded island. I guess you could say that our second part of our adventure should be titled Back to the Future. Yes, it comes, it's north and south. This is the very south end of the Yellow Bypass. And I think you were saying that these levees, uh, your company, uh, Derek Pacific and Wildlands Inc., they're going to clear this out, huh? Yeah, the next phase of the project would be to lower all these east-west levees that are perpendicular to the flow of the bypass. Okay. So I guess that'll be really good for the baby salmon coming out of the Yellow Bypass, huh? Yeah, it's more, you know, a smoother flow out to the out to the, the rest of the delta and just more productivity with more tule marsh and that sort of thing that'll form on the tops of these old levees. Uh, gotcha. so, so you think some of that will get very marsh-like along here? Isn't it? Absolutely, because it'll all be under the high tide line. Introduce yourself, Bill. My name is Bill Roper. I work for Wildlands. We're a company based out of Rockland, California, specializing in uh, in mitigation projects of all kinds for wetland mitigation for species, uh, you name it, up and down the West Coast. And where am I? You're standing on the Liberty Island uh, Conservation Bank uh, at the very kind of north end of the delta here in the bottom end of the Yellow Bypass. Okay, so the Yellow Bypass, now we go over it in Sacramento when we take the I-80 and um, how does it affect this area here? Uh, when we get floods up in the Sacramento area and the water's coming down, what happens here? Well, this, this area that we'd be standing under, uh, even this year, probably went under seven or eight feet of water. Uh, you know, it's just part of that bypass system. We represent the very bottom end of this and everything from where we're at and south of us and, and, and to the west is all part of the Delta, all part of the San Joaquin Delta. Okay, now Liberty Island began in about 1917, they started building dikes. In about 1918, 1919, they had enclosed this whole area. About how big is this island when it was at its height? Oh, you're catching me off. I, I, it's thousands of acres, and I do not remember the exact number. Several okay. square miles. Square miles. So it is quite huge. And they were growing row crops out here. That's right. And they, grow, they grew the row crops out to when did... It completely give way. Well, they had periodic levee failures, I think, for several years off and on. Um, the way I understand it, the final, when they finally quit repairing levees, was during the, a very wet winter of 97. 
um, which was pretty much the end. They kind of threw their hands up and everybody pulled off whatever they could and that's the kind of, it's been history since that point. Okay, so everything went underwater. Mm -hmm. And as I noticed when we came in, those are huge areas of water. And how deep was it? Oh, right now it's probably, you know, it's it depending on the tide because you know, right. we have about four foot of tide swing. Let's just say it averages seven, eight feet deep across seven, there. Seven, eight feet deep and, um, okay, so now I am um, a salmon. Mm -hmm. And um, are the salmon coming up through this area, or are they finding their way up the Yolo Bypass? Not so much. I, not so much up. I think is coming down. You know, the, the, a lot of what's in the Yolo Bypass and a lot of what gets trapped in the Yolo Bypass are the tiny uh, smolt. Okay, so are, the smolt gets down. caught there. Mm -hmm. um, are they now? We've heard stories about getting trapped and dying. That's right. So, is there ways that uh, are you out here helping create pathways for them to? to uh, exit to the Pacific? Well, in this case, before we built this, this was a, uh, uh, this particular field was actually above uh, high tide, but it had, because the, the levee is, is perpendicular to bypass flows, the water would flow over into this field. And there's actually the three or four ponds that used to be in here that we've since connected to the Delta and to the, to the tides that would actually, salmon would get in them, seeking refuge out of the current and as the water would drop, would be trapped. And opening all this up actually brought them back. So those ponds still exist out here. Mm -hmm. They're just part of our greater channel structure on this end of the island. And so now it's all accessible to them. Even where we're standing, which really only goes underwater on a bypass flow, becomes this kind of high water refugia for the, for the tiny smolt. We thank Bill for taking his time as he headed back to his office. Robert Malcolm passed away in 1951. I'm sure he would not be happy that his life's work had been returned to what it once was. On Liberty Island, the Thule's will once again flourish. From the air, the Thule's will capture carbon dioxide. When they die, their stems will mix with the silt in the Delta's waters. New mounds of peat will grow. For our native smelt and fingerling salmon, new hiding places will be created. We noticed palm trees standing like sentinels, marking where homes once stood. Other islands have also been lost to rising seas and failing levees. Delta levees are always susceptible to failure. Just a few miles west of the delta, a series of active earthquake faults could at any time liquefy the delta's levee system, flooding more islands. The brackish waters of the Delta are coveted by both the San Joaquin Valley farmers and even further south by Southern California. Feeding farms in the San Joaquin Valley, huge pumps near Tracy lift Delta waters into the Delta Mendoza Canal. We are in a race against time. Currently, our native Chinook salmon and Delta smelt are on life support. Will California's recovery plans be sufficient to preserve our Delta's wildlife habitat and also save its bountiful agricultural lands? Visiting the Delta takes you back in time. There is the historic Chinese town of Locke, fascinating bridges to cross, ferries, restaurants, and wineries to explore or just kick back, fish, and explore the miles of Delta waterways. For the complete series on Roaming the Foothills, they can be viewed on my website, www.youtube.com user slash Michael Stark 1.